Welcome to ITSUS Verona video series podcast and hello everyone from Igor Shebetun, Greta Bordin, Eastern European branch. Uh, today we are having as an expert Professor Marco Bacheza. Marco Bacheza is a professor of international law and international relations at the Webster University in Vienna. Hello, Professor. Hello there. Thank you for yeah. inviting me. Good to be here. Sure. Uh, today's podcast will be discussing the Russian-Ukrainian war in terms of international law. How international law defines the hostilities, actual war, and uh, of course, uh, what uh, potentially could uh, just regular people could affordably wait uh, from international law system in general. So, if you could uh, ex explain how practice of international law cooperate with the regular people who are right in the center of the war and what they can expect and how in general international law, uh, law determine conflicts and as uh, specifically we can have a look at the example of Russian Ukrainian war right now. So we're going to shift with the first question uh, and my colleague Greta will ask you. So as just uh, my colleague explained, uh, the first question will be very, very general uh, and it was about um, what kind of international jurisdiction could be applied in general to war conflict or, in, in this case, to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict? Good question indeed. Uh, within the broader uh, the, the broad field of public international law, three subsets of rules and norms do apply to the current conflict in Ukraine. The first one has to do with international human rights law, which affords legal protections and rights to individuals and puts obligation, corresponding obligations on states. So states uh, and or those entities that perform state duties have to protect the, the life, for instance, of individuals, uh, provide for access to services, uh, do not starve people, do not traffic in people, just to name a very few gross examples of, what, of, of abuses of international human rights law. The second is international humanitarian law or laws of war, otherwise known as laws of war or laws of armed conflict. And this body of laws usually refers to what is permissible to do during combat and combat operation during warfare. What kind of subjects can be targeted uh, what kind of objectives, uh, how to assess whether a given individual or a given, or a given uh, uh, target is indeed lawful under international humanitarian law. And the third and last uh, body of laws uh, that applies to the current conflict is international criminal law that aims to attach criminal sanctions to gross violations of international humanitarian law. And uh, as as opposed to the previous two sets of norms, international criminal law, just like domestic criminal law, applies to individuals and assess the responsibility of individuals. So you might have heard that in the public debate at some point, certain individuals, starting with Russian President Putin, for instance, were personally accused of being war criminals, of having perpetrated war crimes. So these are the three main uh, bodies of law that apply. Again, international human rights law, that focuses on individuals and the rights that individuals, individuals are entitled to. Uh, international humanitarian law, so the laws of war, what, is, uh, what can and cannot be done under the law during wartime. Uh, and the third and last one is international criminal law, which looks at sanctioning uh, illicit conducts perpetrated by individuals. And um, as for specifically international criminal law, what kind of crimes could be find in this conflict? So uh, the one court that is seized of jurisdiction with regard to the, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine uh, uh, is the International Criminal Court, or ICC for short, uh, uh, which was established in 1998, entered into force in July 1st, 20 2002, so almost 20 years ago today. And uh, this, uh, the subject matter jurisdiction of this court is quite limited in that it only covers uh, three plus one. Uh, I will explain why three plus one crimes. War crimes, which is actually a broad category of crimes, although uh, refer to the label term war crimes, crimes against humanity that focuses on widespread and systematic attacks against civilians. And then of course, genocide, which can or cannot be seen as the apex of the crimes against humanity category. Apart from this, there will also be the crime of aggression. 
and the invasion, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine is just one of the many ways in which uh, state forces can uh, perpetrate the crime of aggression. The reason why I said three plus one is because this peculiar, this particular crime, uh, as a matter of fact, does not fall under the temporal jurisdiction of the court with specific regard to Ukraine. Uh, because it only entered into force in uh, July 2018, which is after Ukraine had already accepted the jurisdiction of the court. So there's no retroactive jurisdiction with regard to aggression specifically. So as far as the ICC is concerned, with regard to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, we only have war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Is there any instrument that uh, international law system, especially the, the international court, can pull up to uh, to actual tracking Russia's representatives in that conflict, unless they're going to grab that like intentionally with a force? So, is there any chance to force them to answer? For example, if we determine them an aggressor, to answer and to actually to have any responsibilities and to hold hold these responsibilities in front of the international law? Is there any instrument that we can apply to them? Uh, so if we intend international, the International Criminal Court purely as a criminal court in the domestic sense of the term, we might be disappointed at what the ICC will likely be able to accomplish with regard to Russia and Russian individuals or pro-Russian individuals accused of war crimes, crimes against humanity or wars. This is because Russia is not a state party to the ICC. It initially signed the, the, the treaty, but later on uh, uh, it decided to actually pull out. So the already very limited uh, legal obligations undertaken with the signature, which is something quite different and much less than ratification of the founding treaty of the ICC. Uh, also, even those uh, uh, obligations are no more with regard to Russia. So Russia is under no obligation to cooperate in any way or form. So uh, does not have to provide any uh, evidence, does not have to provide access to witnesses, to crime scenes, uh, to evidence, to documents, let alone uh, it is under an obligation to surrender suspects, uh, or, you know, if and when the ICC will actually issue arrest warrants, naming names, uh, uh, the Russia is under no obligation to, to apprehend and surrender those suspects. So these are the limitations of the ICC, which was established this way to be under uh, uh, quite uh, an extensive state control. Uh, what the ICC can accomplish is something not purely a criminal, uh, which is, uh, you know, it can attach a stigma. The moment that an independent uh, uh, an expert court calls uh, some individual, one or more individuals, whether Russian citizens or separatists or even Ukrainians or of a different nationality, once the ICC uh, goes public, goes on record calling somebody a war criminal, yeah. um, within a certain audience, especially a Western audience, that carries consequences that might actually curtail the ability of high ranking of, of officials of Russia to travel abroad and to carry out diplomatic efforts, for instance. If, if Lavrov is accused of, of war crimes, for instance, uh, his, his duties as foreign minister will be greatly curtailed because he will not be able to travel to 123 sovereign countries anymore. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, sum up like, so the main instrument that's gonna be as a sanctions, if we understood you right. So the sanctions like uh, limitations to to do economic uh, trading between the countries, right? To do any any relations, traveling, basically to like once they are in their state, so they are totally okay. But once they are abroad, so they will be forced to answer uh, after their after their acts they did, right? They are under the constant threat of being arrested and turned over the court. I mean, like uh, you, you know that most people uh, accuse the West of hypocrisy with regard to you know selectively enforcing these laws. For instance, few people know that in Germany in 2011, uh, um, uh, an NG a number of NGOs actually filed for the arrest of President Bush, Bush's son, Bush 43, who was in Germany for an event at the time, and uh, and only for a few moments, a former U.S. President Bush was not formally arrested by German police. Uh, at some point, somebody thought it was a good idea to actually 
kick him out of the country the sooner the better but but you know uh, um, the idea is that ever since 2011 ever since that that event uh, bush has never traveled back to to europe for any reason really <laughs> yeah that's interesting actually and um, also uh great and i prepared like specific question related to human trafficking uh, uh so what russia did so they basically transport a lot of people from occupied territories from Ukraine uh, with excuses that they provide that they're gonna provide for uh, for these people some custody, some protection. But eventually those people who were transported in Russian territory, they went through uh, like special camps, filtration camps. So but it just like part of the crime, right? But also how international law consider that steps like these acts from Russia's side. So basically they took other people allegedly about take caring about that, but actually the main reason of, uh, of that moment was actual war that Russia initiated. So if, is it, can we consider that as a human trafficking uh, or it just, uh, it's kind of difficult to determine that exactly what they did because uh, they represented as help but we consider that as a human trafficking. Can we say that in that action? Uh, yes, although to be completely honest, when we talk about international criminal law, we talk only about certain crimes. And this is, might be a, a, a legalistic distinction, but human trafficking is a transnational crime. Usually non-state actors, uh, organized crime groups uh, 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 undertake to commit these crimes like drug trafficking, human trafficking, arms trafficking. Uh, what you refer to, which is indeed you know, uh, which constitutes, you know, as empirically it is human trafficking, uh, but for a different purpose, the idea to re-educate these people uh, through labor camps. And in the meantime, basically exploiting their free to cheap labor. So it's like enslaving them for rehabilitating them and making them good citizens of, of Russia in the near future or in the distant future. Uh, this is an attack on civilians because uh, most of the people who were apprehended and deported from Ukraine, from their homes to uh, these labor camps or re-education camps, call it the way you like, these were civilians. So this is uh, an action carried out under the authority of the Russian state to uh, deport uh, uh, thousands, I don't know how many, I, I heard tens of thousands, if not even more than that, uh, of Ukrainian residents and Ukrainian nationals forcibly from Ukraine to somewhere in Russia against their will to be re-educated and being basically enslaved in the meantime. That is certainly a widespread and systematic attack against the civilian population, which is the backbone of the definition of a crime against humanity. So from an international criminal law perspective, uh, I would uh, be fairly sure that the proper categorization and definition of what Russia has committed with that particular, in that particular instance uh, amounts to a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Anna, uh, uh, Greta, please, as far as I know, you yeah. have for us some uh, interesting question as well. Yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, it's a, a, like, last question to conclude this um, interview. Um, and it's about maybe an off-topic question because more related to international security law. Uh, and it uh, concerns the justifications that were used by Russia uh, for this military mission in Ukraine, because we talk about uh, self-determination and also on uh, self-defense. So if this action can be considered self-defense or maybe even uh, um, preemptive self-defense, anticipatory self-defense, uh, sorry, before we're going to uh, start with that, uh, with, ex, with that evaluation, I would like to add a little bit examples from the history uh, attached to that question that Greta mentioned. For example, the, uh, what we've seen, Hitler did the same thing. He found excuse right. to interfere Austria, uh, Bohemia, Czech Republic. So allegedly he would like to protect Germans, uh, German society on their territories. So uh, whether the same process so we just found an excuse and then interfere anywhere. So actually, uh, are there any limits? Are there any regulations that we can stop this, like prevent these processes in general in international law? Or this is just the power of uh, whoever is the strongest, whoever is the strongest one. So that's, that's the power of the strongest one. 
I would start with actually mentioning what is the legal consequence, the legal effect of calling what Russia has been doing all along with a name other than war. Uh, because for lawyers, war means something specific. War, it, calling an armed conflict war, it means, and it implies that a war, a declaration of war has been lodged with the foreign ambassadors. This is something that has not happened, at least that I know of, since World War II. When Italy, for instance, being aware of what happened, unfortunately, in my country many years ago, no, uh, when Italy declared war on, uh, on England, on the Great Britain, sorry, and, uh, and France, uh, Mussolini summoned the, the ambassadors to his office and literally you know, uh, uh, delivered the declaration of war in their hands. That is the moment when war started for Italy, and war runs until a peace agreement is reached. So from a legalistic standpoint, you always know when war starts and when war ends. When there is no such thing as a declaration of war, we refer to it as an armed conflict. Mm -hmm. So the military, the special military operation led by, uh, conducted by Russia, as far as international law is concerned, is referred to as an armed conflict, which is empirically a war, but doesn't have this legal, uh, uh, legal requisite uh, of uh, a declaration being lodged with the, foreign, with the enemy ambassadors. Um, so this is a key distinction because uh, uh, according to what kind of conflict we are in, more and more uh, uh, laws of war including, for instance, treaties about the laws of war, about international humanitarian law, and conventions apply. Okay? So you have to imagine you know, the, the nature of, of the, the conflict, uh, international versus non-international, and whether or not a declaration was, uh, was made. So war versus armed conflict. And that actually determines the kind of obligations that states undertake under international humanitarian law, what is permissible and what is not. And that has a difference, although it's, it's picky and, and, and might sound trivial to the non-experts. With regard to the justifications, so initially uh, we can fairly say that as of now, Russia has abandoned any real attempt to convince uh, Western audiences that there was any legal merit to what they have done. But initially this was not the case. So uh, much of the repertoire the legalistic and, and rhetoric, uh, uh, rhetorical repertoire used uh, by the Russian government in this instance uh, uh, is the same that Russia used in 2008 with regard to, uh, to the, 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 the military operation, the five-day war in Georgia. Uh, so we do see uh, you know, history repeating itself in, in a short term. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, humanitarian intervention. We, uh, Russia has intervened in order to stop uh, uh, an unfolding genocide, an unfolding uh, uh, persecution and massacre of Russian-speaking minorities in eastern Ukraine. Um, there are some technicalities. Uh, genocide does not apply to linguistic minorities, which is a technicality, okay? Um, but technicalities are part of the law. So technically that would not be genocide, even if something like a genocide was unfolding. Again, uh, uh, truth be told, there was no genocide. And I've written about this, you know, there was no genocide from 2014 to 2021, uh, or even including the first two months of the current year. Uh, so this idea to intervene uh, uh, um, via uh, humanitarian intervention is unwarranted. Uh, so a second possibility could have been the one to say, look, uh, um, the Eastern Ukrainians of Luhansk and Donetsk have been so systematically and historically discriminated by Kiev and the central government of Ukraine that they do deserve uh, independence, much uh, following the example of Kosovo. So not just the normal historical path to independence, uh, but the remedial autodetermination, the remedial independence. Uh, they deserve independence because they have suffered so much at the ends of the Ukrainian government that they deserve an exception to the rule, uh, which was indeed the Kosovo exception. And again, this is not something that, that is warranted under international humanitarian law. Plus again, even the empirical requisite of having suffered so much at the hands of the Ukrainian government, honestly, is not there. Not to say they didn't suffer at all, but there's no comparison in, in quality or quantity 
between Eastern Ukraine and Kosovo, uh, even though, I mean, like somebody can even dispute whether or not the Kosovars uh, have suffered that much. But this is not me. And the last one has to do with self-defense. So what does it mean, self-defense? Self-defense is one of the two and only two warranted uses of force against uh, a foreign uh, state under international uh, law and envisaged by the UN Charter. So it's collective security, basically authorization by the Security Council, which Russia will never get clearly. Uh, because of the veto power of Great Britain, France, uh, uh, and plus the, the U.S., plus reaching the majority of uh, the qualified majority of nine yeses in the in the Security Council, and the other one is self-defense. So, what does self-defense mean? Um, does it only mean when uh, there is an invasion? No, it's much broader than that. But how much broader? That's the issue. So uh, the Russian government has tried to uh, claim that because many Russian citizens were under attack, Russia had the, 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 could claim self-defense to intervene outside of Russia in occupied territories of Luhansk and Donetsk, and even further than that, in the rest of the oblasts and, and Mariupol and beyond, in order to protect the lives of Russian citizens abroad. Now, there are two issues, two issues here. Uh, this interpretation of the norm is uh, very minoritarian. I mean, like there's, uh, there's, there's, uh, it's very controversial at best. So um, usually for the sake of peace in international relations, the main interpretation is uh, invasion, territorial invasion of, of, of a foreign land. But we can discuss. There will always be somebody who says, no, we shall also go as far as including you know, the lives of, of nationals abroad. But this is problematic in a globalized world, of course, because this might actually spark more conflicts than it ends. And secondly, uh, there, is the, there is the issue that Russia has undertaken a policy of giving out uh, uh, passports to Russian-speaking minorities of other countries, uh, the so-called new Russians. So uh, basically, uh, Russia and the Russian government has been accused to create the Russian citizens uh, that it purports to defend uh, by military in intervention abroad. Uh, so the idea is that Russia is the supply and the demand of the problem, uh, whereas you can only be, or you should only be one or the other. So, um, but again, truth be told, uh, ever since, ever since uh, Russia was no show before the uh, International Court of Justice in The Hague uh, in early March, uh, uh, Russia has almost entirely abandoned any legal claim to the legitimacy and the lawfulness of what it's doing uh, in, in Ukraine and beyond, yes. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, as far as I see, so then the only obligation the aggressor can hold if they uh, were tracked down by the winners and the winners write history, right? So basically, can, can we say that uh, winners can rule not just the way how other society will develop, but basically uh, they will determine who is, the, who is guilty, who is not guilty. Because as far as we see, uh, as, as long as Russia is not a part of the international court, uh, basically law system, almost law system, so they are not uh, they are not a part of the law system in general. So once they are on their side, they are in safe and they can do whatever they want. So, um, I mean, yes and no. Uh, I would say that for the first time in history ever, uh, losers uh, can actually bring back their own historical arguments of what actually happened. Uh, historically, you are absolutely correct. Winners uh, brought history, but but today there is such a wealth and diversity of sources that even the losers get to tell their side of the story. And you do have, possibly for the first time ever in history, uh, you do have third parties, independent and technical and expert third parties that actually reach their own conclusions and they are not fed propaganda by either side. Uh, which is why, uh, when, as, I said, as I said before, uh, and the ICC, however limited in what it can accomplish, is, uh, it can accomplish uh, still has the power of attaching stigma to, to uh, uh, potential war criminals. Uh, I do not know when, if and when uh, Karim Khan, the chief prosecutor of the ICC, will, will uh, file uh, uh, requests for arrest warrants. I do not know how many arrest warrants uh, he will apply for, and I do not the, name, uh, the names of the recipients. Uh, but, you know, I would expect uh, some Russian generals, 
um, some people higher up uh, in the command chain, possibly, I don't know, somebody in the uh, joint order, chief. Right? Right? In the joint chief, those, those in command responsibility, uh, those in command responsibility. There is one additional problem though, because uh, the moment you go up and up and up, up the, you know, the moment you climb the, the command chain, you have to prove uh, the responsibility of the rank and file. Those who pull the trigger, those who kill, those who rape, those who destroy civilian property. And then you have to attach uh, that responsibility to their superior on the field. And then the superior on the field on the field commander and the field commander with the central commander and the central commander with most likely the, the, uh, the, the, the yeah. civilian leadership. So I don't know, up to President Putin himself eventually. What can help is, is uh, I, you may have heard that a few days ago, former President Medvedev uh, uh, was, was, uh, uh, was caught writing on Telegram something like, I, I want to crush and destroy all the enemies of Russia. Those are the kind of, of evidence, those are the kind of statements that yeah. usually help prosecutors and, and war crimes investigators building that ladder. Okay, now Medvedev himself, I do not know what his role is right now in the Russian government, other than be very close to Putin. Uh, but, you know, had President Putin, had the Minister of Defense made those statements, the same statement that, that Medvedev did, uh, this, that kind of statement would have helped war crime investigators to, uh, to ICC investigators to actually attach uh, the responsibility of the rank and file of surgeons or of, of tenants on the field uh, up to uh, and linking those acts to the civilian leadership um, at the highest level. Yeah, 100%. And uh, yeah, since, since we went all through significant moment in international law in terms of that uh, war, so that definitely gave us a clue how international law approached the war in general and specifically to that war. Since I'm Ukrainian, of course, it's really significant for me personally. And uh, Greta and I really appreciate you for participation and try to understand for our expectations for ourselves as well and for ITSS Verona in general, uh, evaluation of that problematic from international law. Thank you, Professor, for being with us and hope see you again. That really was, was really, really helpful information because you, you can't find it in regular books just in the 20 minutes as we, as we did. Uh, it was really helpful for understanding all the problematic. Thank you for the invite and please count me in for next year or whenever I can make myself available. Yep, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.